Good afternoon, everyone. I'm your moderator, Deborah Yedlin, Chancellor of the University of Calgary, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual idea exchange. We have an outstanding program ahead, and I'm glad to see that there are so many people able to join us today. Welcome to all of you. Whenever we gather for events like this, in person or online, it's an important reminder of the relationships and places that connect our university. Accordingly, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. This includes the Black Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Dakota, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Our university is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call the City of Calgary. At Idea Exchange today, we're going to explore various facets of the agriculture sector. From groundbreaking technology, policy reform, and research that is pushing innovation in the agri-food and agri-tech sector, to strengthening the integrity of our food supply chain, to ensuring safe and healthy food is on our collective tables, or looking at how to decrease emissions. This is an industry that has been disrupted and will continue to be disrupted. We tend to take for granted the agriculture sector because consumption remains disconnected from production. But today, we're going to bring the agriculture story closer to you. I know we're in for an interesting discussion this evening, and thank you so much for being with us. Now I'd like to introduce your host for today's discussion, Dr. Ed McCauley, President of the University of Calgary. Thank you for that introduction, Chancellor Yedlin, and hello everyone. This is our first idea exchange of 2021, and I'm absolutely thrilled that we're starting the season with such a timely and important topic. These past 12 months, have really highlighted the connections linking our agriculture sector to human and animal health, the environment, the economy, and so much more in our society. We've seen what can go wrong and how much of an impact this can have on every community around the world. But what I hope you'll also see by the end of our program this evening is how the linkages between people, animals, and the environment can also spark positive change and solutions. Through our One Health program, for instance, the University of Calgary is leading groundbreaking research to help us better understand and address the challenges at the interface of human and animal health and the environment. This work is incredibly important to the agriculture sector here in Alberta, and our university is proud to collaborate closely with partners in industry and the community to deliver a range of unique initiatives. Fueled by generous philanthrop philanthropic support, these include programs such as WA Ranches at the University of Calgary, the Simpson Center for Agricultural and Food Innovation and Public Health, and the new agriculture stream in the Creative Destruction Lab Rockies. We're able to tap into the significant local expertise on agri-food and agri-tech and these knowledge outputs position Alberta as a leader, not only with Canada, but also on the world stage. When we're looking at issues like antimicrobial resistance, for example, we're facing a challenge that is not just local, but of course national and global. If we can create solutions to these issues, we can provide an enormous benefit to the quality of life in communities all over the world. One Health reflects this type of big picture, transdisciplinary international impact. It's a belief in limit, limitless potential, and we hope to instill this belief in our students through unique programs focused on hands-on learning and interdisciplinary knowledge. We want students to see the opportunities for a future not only in veterinary medicine, but also in agriculture technologies the financial analysis of agriculture businesses, public policy related to food security, and many other areas where these emerging leaders can contribute new ideas and solutions. Multiple faculties from our university play a role in creating these learning experiences. 
from our Haskein School of Business, the Schuller School of Engineering, and the Faculty of Arts, as well as the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and the Cummings School of Medicine. And at every step of the development and implementation of these programs, our community has provided outstanding support. Initiatives like WA Ranches, the Simpson Center, and CDL Rockies are the result of extraordinary championship from thousands of leaders in our city and province. Thanks to the confidence and investment of community leaders such as John Simpson, Jack Anderson, Wynn and Bob Chisholm, and many other donors and industry partners, we wrapped up our Energize campaign at an outstanding $1.41 billion, the third largest successfully completed fundraising campaign in Canadian history. When we talk about leading research that benefits Canada and the world, about preparing our students to become innovators and key contributors to society, about mobilizing knowledge that will change lives for the better, all of this leadership starts with a community that has believed in our potential to be a great university. I want to thank all of you joining us online for your support and your engagement. It truly means the world to us. The topic of transformational impact is a great segue to the four speakers that I'm delighted to introduce to all of you now. They'll share an overview of their work, followed by a panel discussion moderated by Chancellor Yedlin. Tonight, we'll hear from Dr. Herman Barkema, Professor of Epidemiology and Infectious Diseases and the NSERC Industrial Research Chair of Infectious Diseases in Dairy Cattle. Dr. Alex Ramirez Serrano, Professor of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering and the founder and director of the Unmanned Vehicle System Robotarium Research Lab. He's also the founder and CEO of Forefront Robotics. Dr. Guillaume Lermy, Director of the Simpson Center and Associate Professor, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. And Allison Sundstrom, Founder and CNO of Conservix Inc. and Founding Partner of the Creative Destruction Lab Rockies AgStream. We'll begin tonight with Dr. Barkema. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Ed. We're living in a time where very complex global problems, sometimes called wicked problems, need to be addressed. Examples of these global problems, these challenges, are the COVID-19 pandemic that you all experience, and other disease outbreaks like Ebola, Zika, and Nipah virus, and of course, preventing the next pandemic climate change, loss of biodiversity, antimicrobial resistance, and food and water insecurity. To address these problems, experts from different disciplines need to work together using what is called a One Health approach, a holistic and transdisciplinary approach to understanding and mitigating these complex problems with the goal of improving the health of all ecosystems. Combining diverse expertise will lead to innovative adaptations that better address complex scientific and social challenges. The One Health approach takes a systems view of complex problems, recognizing interconnections of people and animals in their shared environments. Through research, training and engagement, we at One Health at UCalgary are committed to tackling complex problems at the intersection of people, animals, and the environment, and the underlying economic and social factors that determine the opportunities for health across all ecosystems. At the University of Calgary, we have excellent people with a diversity of expertise, and we also have great resources, such as our 19,000-acre beef capital ranch, W Ranches, the Advancing Canadian Wastewater Assets, or AQUA, the International Microbiome Centre, our Health Services Research Centre, uh, W21C, 
the Center for Health Informatics, and the Simpson Center for Agriculture. We bring together people, expertise, and resources to conduct research, invest in the future through transdisciplinary training programs, and we also prioritize translation of knowledge to the community and development of policy to make long-lasting changes. One Health at U Calgary also collaborates beyond the boundaries of our university. We are a very young organization. We are now not even two years old, but we already have started to build strong relationships with indigenous communities, governments, and leadership, regional and provincial non-indigenous governments, and national and international universities and organizations. This painting by John Rombo, a Dene painter from the Northwest Territories, is called The Spirit Surrounding the Land, and it speaks to the belief held by indigenous peoples that we are all related, and the interconnectedness and relationships between people, non-human animals, and the environment as central to health and well-being. The One Health approach has always been practiced and is endorsed by indigenous peoples. It is therefore extremely important that indigenous and non-indigenous peoples work closely together in this approach. To say it in a couple of words, together we go further. So Herman, what does this have to do with agriculture? Many of the problems that we face in agriculture, climate change, infectious diseases, antimicrobial resistant, etc., etc., require a transdisciplinary One Health approach. At the University of Calgary, we are bringing the right people to work together with farmers, veterinarians, and other advisors at these complex problems, with the overall goal that our livestock industry will stay sustainable and will be able to feed Canadians and many others in the world. To say it in a couple more words, working with the farmers for the farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Um, so thank you for this introduction and this uh, event. In this talk, I'm gonna talk to you about the use of robotics and how to cover and, uh, and uh, meet challenges using robotic technology in the farming industry. Several global trends are influencing food security and the overall sustainability of food and agricultural systems. Current food supply faces several challenges, including increased population and climate change, among many others. Currently, there are approximately 8 billion people living in this planet, and it, it is estimated that in 2050, there will be 10 billion. As the population keeps growing, increasing nearly by 100 million people a year, the challenges to our food supply and natural resources will continue to increase. Population growth will boost demand for food, and food will need to be available in increasingly, increasingly larger urbanized areas. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that by 2050, we will require to produce at least 50% more food compared to what we produce today. Simply put, more people and, re and reduced areas to grow food means great demand and stress to the food supply. Another challenge that our food supply uh, faces is who will farm and work on producing food? Even though, even though food demands have been increasing for decades, the rural population is shrinking and the people still farming is aging, causing a shortage of manpower to produce food. Climate change is rapidly altering food production. For example, natural disasters such as floods, droughts, and tornadoes are increasing in frequency and intensity, affecting farmlands, which tend to reduce crop yields. Food waste is another challenge. Uh, it is estimated that between 33 and 50% of all pr food produced globally is never eaten. In a world bombarded with numerous technological advances, more than 800 billion people don't have enough food and go to bed on an empty stomach each night. Although there have been diverse attempts to address these and other aspects using diverse technologies, such as improved fertilizers and better irrigation systems, current technologies are limited. 
Air decay and these and other increasingly critical aspects will continue to be a great threat to our time uh, and, we do have, and we have to do something. But don't worry, robots are coming to the rescue. Um, the Internet of Things and many other technological advances are disrupting the way we produce and grow food in positive ways. From my point of view, robotics and the associated technologies will be disrupting farming in three different ways. First, we will, it will enable us to produce differently using new technologies such as hydroponics and vertical farming to a larger scale. Will enable us to use effective technologies to bring food productions to new efficiency levels and will enable us to incorporate new cross-industry cross technologies such as drones, mobile robots, and advanced sensing, sensing systems, enabling us to better utilize the limited resources. Although in the past, autonomous systems have been slow in terms of development, in the last 10 to 15 years, great developments in material science, artificial intelligence, sensors, computer power are rapidly emerging enabling robots to be used in diverse sectors, such as fruit production. Difficulty, uh, what makes farming the robotics difficult is not that they cannot do a specific task, like weeding, harvesting, and fertilizing, but rather than robots must perform such tasks in sometimes random sequences, precisely and fast. Robots are certainly capable of diverse tasks. Drones and ground robots have already been proven to be useful in aerial surveying, photography, photogrammetry, monitoring livestock, and the technology is being developed for crop, crop inspection, autonomous weed removal, and harvesting. But perhaps the largest potential in the use of robots lies in its mobility, enabling robots to be deployed to work in challenging spaces that constantly change. Although cars are getting very close to driving by themselves, in farming, humans are still needed to monitor machinery and finish the job. The value for the new wave of robots lies in their high dexterity to work in demanding tasks and be ready to be deployed when needed. Like we have seen in other technologies, from cars to smartphones, accelerating larger markets, it will be important to see a cost reduction in, in robots to be able to provide and, 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 and provide these uh, this, uh, technologies to farmers. The future of robotics is great. Right now, we're at the cusp of uh, a revolution in a next revolution in, in robotics where robotics will be able to provide cheaper, faster, and better food services. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Guillaume Lemy, who is going to be talking to you about some interesting uh, aspects about agriculture and food innovation. Thank you. Speaking about um, um, the um, revolution in agriculture, well, as you can see on the timeline, actually there have been already several revolutions, and some scholars uh, have uh, identified uh, already six revolutions. And uh, uh, you see that um, the first one uh, was a long time ago uh, when uh, human beings uh, started to um, plant seeds, and domesticate animals. And of course, now closer from us, there has been the forage revolution, the industry and the uh, industrial revolution, which is also uh, agricultural revolution, and the so-called green revolution, which may not be labeled green revolution uh, as it is now. I um, also want to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, uh, when started the uh, industrial revolution, also started the Anthropocene era, this era when uh, 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 human activities started to uh, disrupt uh, geology and ecosystem. So basic question that we can have is, do we need this seventh revolution where we are headed? So where's the need? And what is the cost of uh, inaction? And I will walk uh, through uh, these uh, needs in uh, my presentation. Major uh, point uh, that we can see is that uh, we can observe a longer, a deeper and deeper gap between urban and human uh, and um, rural population. And uh, uh, if you look at this um, at this uh, snapshot taken from a, a famous social media, actually this, this snapshot has been taken in a grocery store and uh, by uh, French farmers. 
and uh, the, the, the snapshot shows that they are selling uh, small uh, bales of hay at about, at about um, uh, $10 per pound. Do you have any idea of what is the, the true cost of hay? Six. Six cents per pound. So there is a value, and the farmer says, well, there is gold in our prairies. Yes, there is gold in our prairies, but the gold is uh, for whom? So where is the value in agriculture? And basically, there is a, this gap between consumer that see this kind of, uh, of uh, commodities in their, in their shops, and on the other side, producer, entrepreneurs, whom primary function is to produce. And for that, they use inputs, they have constraints, they have risks. And in addition, on the top of that, we have longer and longer supply chains. And uh, these two parameters uh, seem, in my opinion, to, uh, to lead to uh, this statement that consumers have never been so far from producer in distance, but also in awareness. So where's the value? Where's the gold uh, in agriculture? Well, uh, uh, if we come back to the constraint, we have to remember uh, that uh, uh, agriculture has to feed a growing population with limited and scarce resource. And you have here a representation of planetary boundaries. So these planetary boundaries are uh, defined with indicators such as uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gases or biodiversity indicator. And actually, so we have to shift, agriculture has to shift between uh, uh, from um, consuming resources uh, to feed people to new missions. And one first mission would be the maintenance, the maintenance of commons, pollinators, control of erosion, water supply, biodiversity control. Another mission could be to maintain rural development, our cultural patrimony, recreation sites, and of course, economic development. So how we can nudge uh, this uh, revolution now? Well, of course, at a global level, what we need is coordination. But at a local scale, we can also have uh, activities that will help uh, to allow this shift to happen. Policy-wise, uh, we need to favor an ecosystem. Uh, and uh, there are two things that we can do, uh, and I will show two examples that we can do at the Simpson Center. The first is shifting the mindset, the mindset of consumers, the mindset of policymakers. And the second one is nudging a more friendly uh, regulatory environment to show what is the real contribution of agriculture to this uh, broader mission. And the second thing is encourage uh, technology, innovation. And for that, we can develop incentive, push-pull incentive. And I'm pretty sure that Alison Sundstrom will uh, build on this technology. Alison, the floor is yours. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here tonight. I think that I get to speak about the things that I'm most passionate about. And I truly believe that Canada has the opportunity to be a global powerhouse in agriculture. And in large part, it will be driven by innovation. And if you weren't excited by hearing about the robots coming, um, our concept of One Health where animals, plants, and humans are all healthy because of the food we eat, I think you have to be passionately excited. The pandemic exposed a lot of shortcomings in our food supply chains. We think more about food now than we ever have. But it also has also advanced digitization by about five years. For me, that's very exciting. We need to adopt new thinking on innovation instead of looking to the past. We need to look to the future. We need to recognize that the foundation of smart economic renewal will be built through our Canadian companies their, commercializing their ideas to scale globally. A few interesting things to consider. Agriculture outperforms most other economic sectors in Canada. Netherlands, a country the size of Banff, which I know Herman knows well, is the second largest exporter of agribusiness products globally. Now Canada is the eighth. But in terms of commodity exports, we rank fifth. There is a great deal of opportunity to build value-added businesses on top of these commodities. High growth SMEs 
OECD and all our countries understand are the principal engines of any economy. SMEs with IP are 60% more likely to be high growth, and they are four times more likely to export. So what will this take to turn Canada into a true innovation nation? How can we create more value in our commodity products? And how do we create high growth SMEs? We need to create resilience through disruption. The panelists today have demonstrated one critical factor of what it takes, deep science and technology. But we must get our innovations commercialized. Governments need to move from an era of traditional infrastructure to an era of intangibles. We need to invest in protecting our IP. We need to update our trade strategies we need to foster digital adoption and adoption of the technologies on farm. We need to use our tax code and regulatory systems to stimulate innovation and investment. Now I'm here tonight to speak to you about something that I'm very passionate about. The Creative Destruction Lab delivers an objectives-based program for massively scalable seed stage science and technology-based companies. In my opinion, as an entrepreneur, I wish I had had Creative Destruction Lab when I started out. I needed mentorship, support through MBAs, advice, financing, and constructive dialogue, all things that we can find at the Creative Destruction Lab. The McKinsey Report, a very recent McKinsey Report, indicated that over the next 30 years, more than 60% of our physical inputs will be produced through cellular agriculture, a bio-revolution that's coming, alternative processes in uh, new alternative foods. It's an, it's an exciting space. Let's ride this wave. So we need to invest in the future. We need to implement transparency and traceability and last mile agility in our food chains. And uh, the three speakers before me spoke very well to that. We also need to create public-private partnerships in exploring the new frontiers of bioscience and ag. And where we do this is we do this through partnering with our universities, supporting our universities, funding our universities, and moreover, funding our scale-up companies. We need to plant many, many trees and many, many seeds. And using that ag analogy, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but really, the next best time is now. And conversations like we're having tonight definitely set the stage for this. And I'd like to invite Deborah Yedlin back to the stage so we can have a conversation together about this. Thank you, Allison, and thank, to all, thank you to all the panelists for their fantastic presentations. We're now going to move into the Q&A portion of our program, and I'd invite those of you in the audience to send your questions for our panelists. You can submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I'd like to invite all the panelists to come and join me on the stage right now, and we'll get started. We've had a number, of a number of questions come in already uh, from the, on the Q&A chat, and I'm going to start with the first one, and, and uh, I think, Guillaume, you might want to take it, and then we can go from there. What are the priority policies that we need to see legislated to stimulate growth in agriculture? Mm. So, um, this is, of course, a difficult question, uh, uh, because speaking of uh, priorities is always difficult. Uh, everybody has a... Uh, different uh, perception around that, uh, depending on the, uh, the field uh, you are coming. But I, I would say that um, we need to, uh, uh, to uh, unveil, to, to uh, break the chains uh, that, uh, that are uh, limiting people uh, who want to uh, invest 
to want to innovate in agriculture uh, and who innovate in other sectors. Agriculture is a really important sector. In Alberta, I would say that it's not particularly an economic important sector, but this is an important sector because every day we are eating three times for me, I don't know how many times for you, but three times for me, and we are actors of agriculture each time we are doing that. So uh, I would like to, uh, to, to convince people that agriculture is a really important and maybe the most important sector. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna add to what uh, Guillaume said. I think uh, the policies uh, that should be in place um, are have to, will have to be dynamic. I think we're right now we live in a world that is so dynamic, things are changing so fast, and I believe policies will also have to be dynamic and be able to adapt to the current changes, not just to how many people are being born and, and, and dying, but also on uh, the resources that we have, water, clean air, and so on. Those things were depleting, and I think the policies will have to be more changed and adapt as we see it fit as the, uh, as the years go by. Allison, I'm going to throw a question to you. What are some of the near-term agriculture technology and innovation commercialization opportunities for Alberta and Canada? I think we see a, um, a true opportunity to diversify our economy in Alberta through agriculture. Near term, I think that uh, with the advent of low earth satellites and uh, investments being made by people like TELUS, I think that we can connect all of our farms via the internet through to new sensors, new applications, the robots, um, cyber physical in our plants so that we can see ourselves fully automating and moving into the future. The number of technologies are limitless. Is there a risk to relying too much on technology and automation? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think that everyone is, is slightly frightened of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, several other things. Um, I do believe that the agriculture sector actively contributes towards a movement for Canadians to eat better. And I think that we see that automation can actually help us get to that point. So I do think that uh, technology is, is really what's going to motivate us to diversify our economy and do many, um, do many other things that we wish to see. Alex? Uh, just to add to that, I, I believe uh, personally, just because I work with robotics, I don't think that we have to fear about technology. I think the most fear that we have to have is in us using the technology. Uh, just for example, take cell phones. Uh, we tend to abuse, we humans, we tend to abuse and misuse the technology. So I think it's a matter of how we develop the technology and be careful in how to use it. We need a lot of help and not just about more people, but also we need a lot of technology to cope with the demands and, and, uh, and aspects that we need to solve. And it's not just agriculture, it's uh, healthcare, uh, search and rescue. There are so many challenges that we have to do that we have to have help from technology. Another question that's come in, it's from the presentations today, and Herman, this is, I'm going to ask you to answer this or start off the, the answering, is that research will generate a tremendous amount of data. What are the challenges and opportunities associated with analyzing and integrating these very diverse data sets to make transformative progress in agriculture? And is there an opportunity to take advantage of the data analytics developed in the energy sector to apply to the agriculture sector? So there is, uh, thank you for this question. Um, great question. We are indeed generating a lot of data. Um, it is important though that the people that work with the data also know where the data come from. That's the number one I would want to say there. You cannot just analyze all these data and, and treat them as, as data points. So um, then also we need to bring people together that, 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 that can work with these data. So it's transdisciplinary again. We need data analysts to work with farmers, with veterinarians, whatever data we are working on, so that we can really use these data to make the life of animals better, but also the economics of our agricultural industry. Thank you. 
Um, a question for you, Guillaume. Can aquaculture take the pressure off agriculture or can the seventh agriculture revolution enable us to avoid the unintended consequences of aquaculture? Um, the, the most important difficulty is to uh, be able to forecast unintended consequences, actually. Right. And uh, they are in any human activities, unfortunately. Um, I, I would say that um, um, we need to think uh, agriculture as a system and in, within the food system where uh, people, consumers, will um, have the opportunity to consume probably differently, being more engaged, and, uh, and technology will help them to, uh, to, to become closer uh, from the producer so that they will be able to, uh, to make their choices. I wouldn't say that there is one uh, kind of production that is better or, or worse than the other one. Uh, I would, I, I'm leading to say that uh, actually uh, all the productions are making a lot of effort uh, to produce uh, in a better way, meaning uh, improving animal welfare, and also with, an, uh, I would say, an environmental awareness. So there's an interesting question. I think, Herman, you can start with this one. Where do you see regenerative agriculture fitting into the future? And will, um, and in terms of um, uh, uh, climate change and agriculture production? So first, I think it's very important uh, that we, we think of the future, eh? that we not uh, uh, try to keep the, the, the systems like they are right now. Eh? What, what is coming in the future? One of the problems that we have right now is that um, the people living in the countryside and the people in the cities are more and more away from each other. And uh, that the goals that, uh, the, uh, that the people in the cities have, where are most of the consumers live, are actually uh, quite different from people that live in, uh, in, uh, in rural areas, where all the, the farmers are. So we need to make sure that they together uh, understand each other and come to the, the solutions there. I think that's the most important thing for us uh, to work on. I'd like to. Yeah, please. I, um, Bill Gates, who I respect immensely, came out this week and indicated that he felt that wealthier nations should abandon livestock. And I would suggest that uh, regenerative agriculture, which relies on livestock, is uh, absolutely essential. And I think that we monitor efficiency and other things uh, incorrectly. Uh, I also think, and this goes back to your previous question, that we have to really, in agriculture, we have to face reality. And there are things that we have to change. We have to respect animal welfare. We have to do a number of different things. But livestock and animal agriculture have a place. New methods such as uh, cellular agriculture also has a place. But we have to confront our issues within the industry uh, address them and understand that agriculture and animals have a place in climate resolution. And where does blockchain fit into this in terms of traceability and monitoring? New technologies like blockchain give us an opportunity to perhaps um, provide greater provenance of our food, traceability, security, and uh, we should not um, be confused about technologies that we consider fearful um, the conversation about robots that Alex had. All of this technology offers us ways of doing things in a better, more streamlined, and more secure way. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, maybe just uh, one quick comment uh, about this uh, blockchain technology. Because I think that it, I, I perfectly agree that uh, the fact that it can help to uh, to, to make uh, producer and consumer closer because it's quite easy uh, to know where your food comes from. In addition, it can also help in the food supply uh, transparency, so improve transparency and basically uh, decrease the cost of production just because uh, at each stage of the supply chain, then uh, the people or the companies will be aware of what the, uh, what the other stage uh, is doing. Alex. Can I just add something? I, I, I believe the, the farming and the food supply uh, 
system is so complex that everything is interrelated. Uh, so basically, I think, uh, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet that will solve all the problems. And I think we have to use a myriad of technologies and, and, and approaches to do this, and uh, is robotics, uh, precision farming, uh, new machinery and things. So I think all these things have to be, as, uh, as uh, was said before, together in harmony. And, uh, and we as humans have to make it live in harmony and develop these things as we see fits. And once again, it will have to be adapting based on the changes that we see in the environment, society, humanity, and all those things. One of the issues that we're confronting as a, as a, as a, as a, as a globe is the issue of, of climate change and the decision by some governments to implement carbon pricing. How difficult is it for farmers to commit to decreasing emissions, which make up about 10% of Canada's emissions? Um, and are, is there low-hanging fruit? Is there a different mechanism to address uh, car emissions in the agriculture sector relative to the rest of the economy? Maybe I can at least give my, uh, my, my insights about that. So this, this will be one of the uh, main research topic of the Simpson sector, actually. So we will investigate that. Um, coming back to, the, to my uh, um, previous point uh, uh, in, in my uh, five-minute talk, I think that uh, we need to uh, think about our culture with these new missions. And within these new missions, we have to think about uh, uh, activities uh, aiming at curbing climate change. Carbon trap, carbon sink, uh, new kind of energy, all these, uh, all these uh, activities that will um, uh, or not actually uh, rely on, uh, on uh, technologies will definitely help and this has a value and we have to show the people that this has a value. Climate change um, and carbon offsets uh, cap and trade programs, mm -hmm. taxes. I don't think we have the right mechanism yet, but we know that we do have to concentrate on this. We also have to respect that ESG, our diversity, um, many of the things that we're looking at today, I mean, this is the future. Mm -hmm. Now, creativity and innovation in our carbon markets is actually something that we need, and I think agriculture can lead that discussion. In, in what way? In what way? I think that we're already doing things. Um, number one, most farmers are stewards of their land. Mm -hmm. uh, they've grown up. They don't think about just the money they're going to make today and then the exit. They're thinking about how they're going to invest in their land. Simpson Center, perfect example. How will we invest in our land for the next generation? Multi-generational thinking about land, environment, climate, everything is what we have to focus on. Now we can have unique economic strategies to respond to this, and we can also have great production strategies that respond. I actually think we're up for the challenge. Herman, I th you mentioned the importance of indigenous partnerships, and I think, what, I was wondering if you could sort of elaborate on that in the context of what Alison was just talking about from a climate change perspective. Poo, <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I think we can learn a lot from the indigenous peoples on to think of ourselves as stewards of the lands, like Alison says, and, and how we are going to give this earth to our children. Um, and sometimes I notice when living in the city that some people in the city think that farmers um, are not as interested in this. While my experience is that farmers are people that are extremely interested in, uh, in, in as stewards of their land. Uh, they love to have generations on the same land, want to give their land to their, to their children. Um, and that is actually quite similar if I talk to, to indigenous peoples. So they also think of the future, yeah? and, and, and we have a lot of history, of course, uh, there. So I think we need to work uh, together on it. Alex, I have a question for you uh, about how robotics and new technology can help farmers get past bad weather. And the question is, normally once the seed is planted, the rest is a crapshoot. What can <laughs> we do to rely, like, how can technology help? Well, I think, uh, um, 
as I was mentioned in my talk, I think robotics is getting to the point where, where now it's able to, to deploy robots, not just in, in benign weather conditions and when the, the, the climate is sunny and, and, and beautiful, uh, but I think now the computing power, artificial intelligence and all those things are enabling us to deploy these, uh, these robots in adverse weather conditions. It's not just adverse weather conditions, but also to unpredicted, unpredictable changes. Uh, and that's where robotics, I think, from my point of view, is, is heading. Uh, not just enabling and programming these systems to do a task again and again and again, like we do in industry, but to do a task again and again and again on the various uh, conditions. You know, sometimes uh, uh, we want to irrigate, and sometimes we might have uh, problems with, uh, with uh, Sun, uh, sun exposure and, uh, and animals that are living in the, far, in the fields and so on. So I think robots will have to be adapting uh, to the changing uh, conditions that are taking place every second of the day. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Herman. Yeah, so uh, one of the roles of, of robots is, uh, is this repetitive action, but actually that they do sometimes a better job than the farmer in, uh, in certain actions. So if we, if we think of milk robots, okay. eh, they, they milk the cows every single time the same way. And if animals like one thing is being treated well every single time. And they also detect that the temperature is higher in the milk, so that an animal may be sick, of that there are proteins in the milk that, 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 yeah, that uh, indicate to, uh, to an infection. Okay. Yeah? We, we also have that with, uh, with, with feedlots, eh? and Alison knows uh, even more about this than I do. Eh? Um, we, we, we can detect the temperature of, of, of the animals in the feedlot better, and earlier can we detect sickness than if you do it as a human, because cows are animals that, that they like to hide that they are sick. Sure. Because they, if they are, look like sick, predators will know it. They try to hide it. Yeah? And so, uh, so if you then have objective measures like, like temperature or proteins in, in, the, in the milk, then we can help these animals earlier. Alex? Well, just to, to add to that, Herman, I think uh, you put it really nicely. Uh, just because robots are, for many people, are something that is going to take away our jobs, I will uh, say that robots, as, just, as you said, are not just taking our jobs, but are enhancing our abilities. Mm -hmm. They're not taking away our jobs, they're enhancing our abilities to do things better. Uh, so just in a nutshell, I think robots, it's, uh, it's something good that uh, once again, we, we should not abuse and misuse. Yeah, and because of milk robots, uh, farmers now don't have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to do the, do the milking. Yeah, so they, they then yeah, can bring the children to school, can have breakfast with them, uh, can actually have a way more normal life. I know a lot of people who grew up on farms that were wishing that that was a possibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question and it goes, it's, we need the best regulatory and tax framework that is aligned with the purpose of competing in the global markets through sustainable market of sustainable market based economy. That would mean measuring and taxing undesirable byproducts and would mean not taxing long-term investment and, and employment. It's a major shift. We currently talk diversification, we talk transformation, but we, old, we use old economy rules framework. Who would like to take that question? I would love that question because although I've spent most of my life in animals, I started out as an accountant and uh, I think that our taxation structure is something that we can use. Um, the financial levers we can use to incentivize uh, farmers to adopt new technology. Uh, accelerated depreciation is obviously one methodology, but we also have to move into a more future kind of proofing where we're looking at tax structures that are not punitive, but rather incentive based. We also have to look at regulatory sandboxes. Technology is rapidly advancing, and uh, if we look at things like genetics and genomics, we've seen a lot of punitive measures on genomic technology which should not be there. We need to inform our population, we need to inform our leaders, 
And that comes from university environments. So we need to say if we have a technology like CRISPR that can advance the type of, of crops we have, maybe we don't need the robots <laughs> if we can adapt to the climate sure. through, through a genetic-based technology. But do we have a government structure, a taxation structure, and a regulatory structure that can respond to our advancements? So I'd like to see us move into a much more agile framework for taxation and for regulation. Yeah, maybe I can just chime in and, and say that. So, so the topic of today is, uh, is revolution in agriculture. Uh, however, uh, we also have to be uh, quite realistic and, and uh, the, even, in, even if, we, if we start here or, or if we accompany the, the movement, uh, we want to trigger that. Uh, we also have to be aware that we are uh, living uh, in a global world uh, with, uh, uh, of course, competitive interests. And so I believe that uh, we need to go step by step. And so we are in uh, academia and, and, and uh, uh, and the business sector are uh, really proactive. Uh, uh, we want to develop this kind of new approach. And so one step is to uh, uh, have at the same time uh, regulatory uh, bodies that are aware and that are willing uh, to see and encourage innovation uh, to um, address these, uh, big, these big challenges. Um, of course, we can completely reset the system uh, and see that we need a new economy or a new world. Um, I don't know, this is more or less a, a moral imperative or, or ethical, uh, and this is, I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't think this debate today. So we are talking about innovation, we're talking about uh, the importance of uh, the ag community adapting, uh, adopting new technologies and processes. It's expensive. So how do we make sure that farmers and, and industry that's involved in the agriculture sector can afford to, to adapt adopt those these new technologies and innovations that come their way to maximize the potential of what their business is what do we need to do maybe i'm just going to take that question uh, it's a complex question it's uh, it's complex because uh, always new technology is always going to be expensive you know it's expensive to develop it's, a, it's expensive to prototype and so on so adaptation and adoption of the technology will be key the faster we adopt uh, the, hopefully the technology price goes down, uh, but also the other aspect is timing. For example, in terms of robotics, maybe 10 years ago, we will purchase a robot to, uh, sensor to use in a robot, and that sensor maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it will cost us $25,000. Today, the same sensor might cost us $200. Right. So, and that's because of a scale in, of production, manufacturing, and, uh, and adoption of the technology. Initially, uh, if the, the adoption is fast, these prices will go down. But usually that doesn't happen. Uh, the adoption usually takes uh, a slow steps increments. And uh, so that, I think that's going to be one of the challenges uh, with new technology. How to enable the technology to be seen as a, something good, something that is going to enhance our, our abilities without having to incur into high costs. Is that yeah. what you talk about, the sandbox? Actually, Deborah, I, th I feel differently. Okay. I want a little more revolution than evolution, um, and back to Guillaume's point. And I also want to see that technology developers understand what the small return is on farming. It's a very narrow return. So our technology, actually we will get adoption because our technology offers a positive return on investment. Technology optimizes costs. We may not be able to do much with the top line. That's driven by market forces. But we can definitely improve the bottom line. And I love the comment that Alex made. We are seeing the cost of technology drop at an exponential rate. And we need to keep our adoption up. So I'm really saying let's push the envelope on all these things, mm -hmm. regulatory, taxation, development, and particularly adoption of our technology. So Herman, you alluded to um, um, genetics and modification. I'm just curious as to whether, where you see uh, genetically modified uh, organ uh, foods fitting into the evolution of, of agriculture. And what do we need to understand as a population about GMOs? 
I mean, that is, uh, that, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, because uh, GMOs, uh, some people are just dead against it. Mm -hmm. um, actually, selection uh, that is, is also genetically modifying. Uh, so so uh, it is very difficult to, to, to say where that will go. I think we need to go for uh, resilience against diseases, uh, for... Um, yeah, using uh, food better as an animal, converting it. But of course, we need to guard that uh, if we play God, like people, some people call it, eh, that it won't have any negative effects. So uh, this needs to be very well investigated. And I know that in agriculture, there's not a lot of use of, uh, of GMOs, actually. Now, I'd like to just ask one question to Allison at the end. Allison was on a, on a webinar with the uh, Haskane School of Business earlier this year, and she talked about having a superpower. So I would like to ask her what she thinks Canada's agriculture superpower is. Okay, our superpower is our resources, our commodities, and our people. As evidenced by the, by the intelligence around this room, it's innovation in a nutshell. So. We are going to be agile and we will innovate, Deborah. Okay, does anybody else have anything to add in terms of? Uh, if you look, at, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands, um, what is the size? It's 1 20th of Alberta, something like that. Look at the land that we have. Look at the people that we have. Uh, we have I a mean, different climate than the Netherlands. <laughs> The climate is, is I, I did not move to Alberta for the climate, to be very honest. <laughs> Although, uh, in <laughs> rain is not always good either. Mm. Yeah, but, so, um, but I love the, 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 yeah, the people and the spirit that we have here, particularly in the West. Yeah, if we look at the sector that I'm most familiar with, dairy industry, the adoption of the milk robots is way higher in the West than it is in the rest of Canada. And, and that's just uh, yeah, a, sim a symptom yeah. of how we think and how we, we do in Western Canada. And then look at the land mass that we have eh, and, and, and the people that we have. And, but we need to continue to, to, uh, yeah, to stimulate innovation and education. We need young people eh, to work with us in, in this. And I think, you know, of course, I'm a university prof, but, but I really would like to see uh, that we yeah, put efforts in uh, educating more and more young people. 20 seconds, Alex, and then to Guillaume, and we'll wrap up. Well, if I had a superpower, probably it would be erasing the history, the past. And not in terms of the, all the things that have happened, but the influence that we have had negatively from the past. For example, as I said, robotics. You know, many people are afraid of robots because we are influenced by Terminators and Hollywood movies and all those things. Well, in Japan, for example, they love robots. That's because they have been influenced by this character, Astro Boy, which was a little character that helped people. So the division of robotics here in America, North America versus Japan is totally different. And that's just because the influence that we have had from the past. So if I had a superpower, I will try to, I will aim or will we'll wish that we could eliminate all the negative influences that we have had from the past, reset it so that we can actually see our future in a better way. Guillaume? Well, I would say uh, simply um, encourage uh, individual initiatives and uh, entrepreneurship and uh, create a favorable ecosystem where people can cooperate. Thank you very much for that succinct wrapping up of our, our, uh, our panel. Uh, I really want to thank everybody for being here today, for everybody who opted to ask questions. We had over 100 questions, and I apologize uh, that we didn't get to anywhere near the 100 questions. I want to thank the audience for those questions, and I'm sure we all learned something this afternoon, especially about the robots and how they're milking the cows. Um, today's uh, idea exchange will cap off with four breakout room sessions. Each one will be 15 minutes long, and you will be able to tune in to, and learn about different areas where the university is involved in agriculture and ask questions in smaller groups. Everyone will have time to attend a total of two sessions, and here they are. 
Advancing Canadian Wastewater Assets with Dr. Leland Jackson. Discover how Aqua benefits local and global communities by transforming today's wastewater research into tomorrow's innovative technologies, which recover resources, improve efficiencies, and protect environments. Studying the cattle industry in a real farm context with Dr. Ed Pager. This session will explore how WA Ranches is pioneering advancements in the ranching industry and teaching the complex relationships between cattle, people, and the environment in a real world setting. Third breakout room is building solutions for the entire agriculture value chain with Anita Ludwar and learn about the Rockies CDL Ag Stream. It's based in Calgary, leverages the region's vast pool of expertise in agriculture technology and science to help founders massively scale and rapidly commercialize their startups. It's been super successful, We're very excited about that. And finally, advancing the study of the Arctic with Dr. Mary Beth Murray. This session will look at work by the Arctic Institute of North America, which collaborates with Northern and Indigenous organizations, researchers, and institutions. And the Institute aims to acquire, preserve, and disseminate information on physical, environmental, and social conditions in the North. You'll find links to join these sessions in the chat box. In the meantime, thank you so much for joining us for today's Idea Exchange. Please stay safe and enjoy the rest of your evening.